Thank you again, brother, for praying. So precious that we've got access into the presence of God. You know, in such an hour as this, that I can run and find a place of refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all my salvation. From a child, you know, I didn't have education. I didn't have all of these things, but I did have the Lord Jesus Christ. Four and a half years old, believe it or not, I got saved in Shropshire, England. I, I learned to speak in England. Uh, you can tell by my accent here this morning. I, I think I maybe lost it along the way a bit. But I tell you what, I didn't lose him. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's been my life. And I believe when you have intimacy of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll have you in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. Since I've lived my whole life for this time, I believe all the trials near broke my heart. In fact, broke my heart time and time again. Trials, decades. You can ask my wife, we'd say, incessant without a month's break. I'm talking decades of troubles. For this hour, God goes to a lot of effort to prepare people for a certain hour. Do not miss the hour that we are now living in. Please turn again with me to, where's my Bible? Um, to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, thank you. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 22. And I want to read these three verses again in the light of what we've said and in the light of part two, where are the sons of Issachar? I want to give you the second part and you couldn't understand this if you didn't hear the first part. So this is leading into it. Very, very important what we're dealing uh, with. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 22. For at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host like the host of God. What a verse. Verse 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. And then last of all, verse 38. All these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. Oh, that again... In the body of Christ. I don't care about titles. I don't care where you worship. But I do care about who you believe in. I do care about your born again experience. Every revival in church history. The greatest revivals didn't preach some profound truth. They come back and preach the new birth again afresh. You may say everyone in Britain. The church knows what it means to be born again. I utterly disagree. I believe they've destroyed the meaning of the birth of a real Christian, a new creature, a new creation in Christ through the blood, through repentance, faith in the blood of Jesus. We have destroyed it. Once again, let God pour out his spirit and we are going to have preachers rise up and preach. You must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark my words, let a revival come. It won't be a new revelation, but it'll be dealing with the new birth in the body of Christ. This second part, where are the sons of Issachar? Verse 32, understanding the times and to know what we ought to do. We've already mentioned this word time or times. Discerning the time or the various times in history and in church history, in Acts chapter 3, Peter preaching, he talks about times of refreshing. He's talking about revivals that would begin with his preaching of repentance and continue until the Lord Jesus Christ would come again. And so he said there are times of refreshing. This word times means set, specific, chosen, 
ordained times throughout history, politically and in the church. There are times of refreshing. That word has been destroyed by all the false revivals. But I believe in revival. I believe in mighty outpourings of the Holy Spirit. I believe in biblical revivals. We, we have read about them. Don't give up hope in revival. There are set significant times of refreshing where God comes to revive a remnant and it's always a remnant. He never starts revival in the big gatherings. That's why I've got a lot of hope here this morning. It's not the massive gatherings, conventions and uh, denominations. It's always the despised few that are walking to a different drumbeat. Peter also talks about times of restoration, not singular, plural, times of the restoration of all things prophesied by the prophets that we have read about. There are significant times where things are restored again that God prophesied about thousands of years ago that he's going to do. Or in Psalm 102, it talks about the set time has come for God to favor Jerusalem. In other words, for him to visit, to revive, to restore. And then there's Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. Until, talking about time, until the ancient of days comes and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possess the kingdom. I'm not kingdom now. I reject it. I believe in a literal interpretation of Bible prophecy. We're not going to usher in the kingdom. God help us. All those people are in for a shock because it's not going to get better. They're not going to take over politics. But I want to tell you, Jesus will come back one day and he's going to set up his kingdom. There's an hour. It's not today when the saints are going to possess the kingdom. There is a set ordained time. Aren't you glad for these times that God has ordained? Then in Acts chapter 17, talking about all the nations, about how God has set the nations in the world. It says there that God himself has appointed the times before appointed. In other words, God has set times for nations. There's been a set time for England for Wales, for Scotland. Haven't we read about it in revivals? God came in 1859. He came in 1904. He's come at many different times to cities, to nations, to cultures, and he's bypassed other nations. Southern Ireland was bypassed by all the great revivals. It was held in the darkness of Catholicism when Britain was being swept by revivals. My hope is I'm saying, Lord, do not forget Ireland. Give us a day of visitation again. Catholicism, let it break. And again, visit, your, visit a people who are small in your sight. And so we see that this word time is very, very important in the Bible. Jesus, again, speaking in Luke chapter 19, 44, Speaking to Jerusalem, he says, Thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. You don't even realize, Jerusalem, that if you miss this hour, this specific time, if you don't realize what's happening in Jerusalem, who it is that's preaching unto you, and you don't receive the message, Jerusalem, it's going to mean your destruction. That's how vital it is to be in time. You see, we can't say God is sovereign and it doesn't matter what we do. We'll get there in the end. You can miss God's timing. A church can miss God's timing. A real Christian on his way to heaven can miss God's ordained time. I promise you, I've watched it all my life. There's men that have made a ruin of things. Oh, they cry tears and say, I'm going to heaven. But you missed the visitation of God and God's appointed time. All these verses speak about set ordained times by God. When we come to the Greek language in the New Testament, when we deal with the word time or times, there's two different Greek words for time. There's one uh, Greek word called chronos. It means to look at your watch and set a specific hour uh, with the watch. But there's another word called kairos. And some people talk about a kairos moment or a kairos time. Kairos isn't just looking at your watch and saying, I'll meet you at 12. Kairos is something very different. 
Kairos is the right time. This is what it means in the Greek. The proper time, the critical time, the opportune time, or the best time for action. If you don't act at that time, you may not get it again or may not get it for decades. I had an old friend come under deep conviction of sin. He, he was picked up traveling up through Britain as a hitchhiker. And as he got in the car, the guy started to preach to him and evangelize. The conviction of God fell on him. He knew the Lord Jesus was calling him to repent and to believe and to be forgiven. He got out of the car at his destination and he said, no God, not today. He said, 20 years. He waited. He didn't get convicted again for another 20 years. As a man of about 50 years old, the Spirit of God come to him and he repented immediately and got right with God. There was a uh, Kairos moment. There was a time God was dealing. You don't tell God to fit into your time schedule. You as a church, you pastors, Pastor Steve and many others, you do not tell God to fit into your time schedule. We cannot create moves of God or revivals. We cannot make things happen. We don't have that power. But when God moves, you better be ready. Your job is to prepare as individuals or as a body of people. Be ready ready to move when God says move. You can't make that happen, but you better be open. He's in charge. You are not in charge. It is a now time. It is a crisis time. It is a short window of opportunity that demands action or a response to God. What is happening? You ought to be asking yourself, in this hour that we are living in, can I tell you, I believe we're living in a Kairos moment for the church in Britain. I believe we're in an utterly unique time. And much of the church doesn't know the hour they're living in. So they're not responding. They're not acting in this hour. I want to tell you, I'm acting. I know the hour that we're living in. It was July last year. We went to teach our church on Bible prophecy. The Lord immediately stopped me and drew me towards the great reset of Schwab, uh, 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 Klaus Schwab and all that was happening with the fourth industrial revolution. I didn't know his face. I didn't know his t uh, name. I hadn't spent time in the World Economic Forum, but immediately I knew you've got to warn your local church. You've got to tell them what's coming. I looked at the world stage. Everyone's caught up in what's happening with race riots or with this COVID. And the church is looking at all of this. And I'm going, that is not the real issue. This is the real issue. I felt the Lord telling me, you've got to speak out. I didn't want to. I kept pushing it away until finally sitting in my study one day, as clear as anything I heard, if you do not put out a video this very week, you are going to miss this. Saints, I cannot tell you, I put my first video in the Great Reset out, and the consequence with that, with sinners coming into the kingdom, is unbelievable. Ten days later, ten days after God spoke to me, it said on the news items that the Google search for the Great Reset was the top search worldwide on Google. Ten days after the Lord said that to me, I'm talking about a Kairos moment of just being in the will of God. You have to be ready for that. Many years ago, some of you older ones will remember this scenario. John Major was Prime Minister of Great Britain in the early 90s. Coming up to uh, 94, John Smith of the Labour Party rose up to power. For two years, he led the Labour Party. And it looked like he is going to be the next Prime Minister of Britain. He had years on his side. He had time, energy, eloquence, and he was going to change everything. A very nice man, a, very, uh, a, a man that would impress you. But do you know what happened? I had a good friend who was going to come and preach on a Sunday night for us in Scotland. And when he got there that night, he says, I want to tell you what happened this week. He said, I was on a plane. He worked for BP and he would also be a preacher of the word of God. And when he preached that night, he said, I was on the plane this week, flying in first class. And I sat down. Who should actually sit beside me? John Smith of the Labour Party. He said, as I sat there, he said, this cannot, this must be ordained of God. 
God's hand must be upon this. And so he started to pray and say, Lord, do you have any word for this man who's going to become the national leader? Everyone is saying it. And he's going to have years ahead of him of leading this nation. As he sat there, the Lord spoke to him and said, this man shall not rule as clear as anything. On a Sunday night in a small church up in Scotland, that preacher got up and told us that. He said, I'm telling you, the Lord told me in that plane, this man will not rule. Just a short time after that, I was shocked when I opened up the paper and I seen in 1994 that John Smith had died of a heart attack. It was Blair took over the Labour Party and three years later took over the nation in politics. I'm telling you, there are Kairos moments. There are remarkable things that go on in a nation. We, we always think we're going to separate politics from the church. And I understand there is a realm in which we do. But there's another realm as far as the real church goes. I am not separated. You see, it's in this hour of a change of politics, of world events, of social things going on. We are the church of this hour. You have been called for this hour. I've got everything to do with the politics of this hour. I know what's happening in this hour. I ought to be able to discern what's going on. And so we see we're in the beginning of sorrows. Matthew 24, we are in the beginning and it's going to become more intensive and closer together and the signs are going to become more obvious and anyone who has any discernment at all is going to begin to wake up and say, this is surely the last hour. It is time for us to do the will of God just one last time. Where are the sons of Issachar, the servants, the soldiers, the students, the scholars? Here in this message, I'm going to shock you now. I'm going to cover a thousand years of Biblical history in the Old Testament in this message. 1,000 years of history from Moses to Nehemiah. I want to show you that there were four significant Kairos moments or movements nationally in which Issachar played their part. And so as a people become marked as a people who could discern the signs of the time discern the hour, and they knew how to not just know what to do, but they knew how to advise God's people and tell God's people, this is what you need to do in this hour. As we look at these four hours of Kairos moments that they could have missed if they were not sensitive to God, and the church in Britain could miss its hour of visitation, it can happen, and it has happened before. So we've got to be very sensitive. First of all, and this is my first four, the first three are positive, but the last one's negative, and I'm going to leave you with a warning here this morning. The first Kairos hour was the time of Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and 5. And this is my first point, Deborah in Judges chapter 4 and 5. When we come to the book of Judges, we see that we have a period of history between the death of Joshua and the rise of the ministry of Samuel the prophet. It was a period of 300 years in the book of Judges. When we come to Judges chapter 4 and the hour that Deborah was a judge in Israel, we read that Israel was not free. They were under bondage to their enemies. Jabin, the king of Canaan, or the king of the Canaanites, was reigning over God's people. He had a general called Caesarea, and they literally oppressed God's people 20 long years. Can you imagine living under utter oppression? Well, yes, because you've just lived through it. Look at the condition of the church since the year 2000. Where's the real preaching of the Word of God in this nation? In this great city of London, where am I going to hear and hear a word from London? I know there are places. I know there's churches like this one and others, but it's very, very hard. You know, we are living under an oppression of the enemy in the nation. We are told in that hour, as they searched the entire nation of Israel, that amongst 40,000 children of Israel... You couldn't find one person who had a shield or a spear 
or the ability to use it. In other words, it was an hour of oppression. The enemy was rising up. But where are the men of war? Where are those standing in the battle? It was at that very time that Deborah arose as a judge in Israel, a remarkable woman of God, a mother in Israel. She judged Israel. She knew the hour. She understood God's plan. She did speak from heaven, and she had a word from heaven. Oh, God, give us mothers in Israel again who understand this. At that time, their enemies were, had an army of 100,000 men, 900 iron chariots and for 20 years the enemy dominated who could stand against them 40,000 of Israel you can't even find one soldier one man with a where's your shield of faith I don't know going down to the pub or or, or contemporary Christian where's your shield where's your spear I don't believe in fighting I just love everyone I love the homosexual I love the lesbian I love everyone I wouldn't tell anyone they need to repent you know that, that, that guy, Steve Chalk, whatever his name, what an abomination of a man. Do you know how the biggest enemy of the church may be in Britain is? It's not Islam at this time. You've got a Steve Chalk who once heard the gospel, had an email from a lady, she might even watch this, and she said, I grew up in youth groups with that man, and I've written to him warning about God's judgment coming upon him. She's a real born-again believer. Saints, what a tragedy that in this hour, some old apostate, and from day one I knew he was an apostate, the guy gets on there, shoot you, listen to him. Why haven't we fought against this? We let it come in, and now he's after your soul. He is going to make sure you get penalized in courts of law. He hates the church of Christ, but we let him survive over these years. We need soldiers again. Where are the shields? Where are the spears in this hour? We're, we're told that Deborah had a word from the Lord. And she spoke to Barak that he was to be the vessel chosen of God to arise in this hour. She judged, listen this in Deborah, or sorry, Judges 4 and 5. She judged Israel at that time. At that time, there was a certain set time that she was judging Israel. She dwelt under a palm tree and was a mother in Israel. In verse 14, it says, she spoke to Barak. Up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Caesarea into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone before thee? Can you imagine Barak missing it? Not that the Lord says, This is the day. This is actually the day today, not tomorrow. Not next week, not next month. Church, are you ready? Are you actually ready for the word of the Lord to come say, this is the day? Oh, I believe sometime in the future. What if it's today God's going to speak to you in a very, very real and a clear way? In verse 6 it says, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded you, Barak, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali, and the children of Zebulun. And so you're to gather 10,000 against an army of 100,000 who have 900 iron chariots and you've been oppressed for 20 years. What an impossible thing. The Lord has commanded you. Hasn't the Lord commanded some of you to do things in here? And you need a preacher to stand up and remind you it's about time you do it. You better be ready to do the will of God. You've got a short period and all this is over. What are you going to do with the rest of your days? What are you thinking of career and family and pension and house and what you're going to do? In the, is that where you're preoccupied? Don't you realize we're the church? We are part of a body of believers for 2,000 years that died in prison cells, that got martyred in the city of London, that shed their blood for freedom and for the gospel that got burnt at the stake in this city and we are cared about the things of this world what are you going to do in this last hour you've got one moment and I'm warning you you will be held accountable what you do in the next year the next couple of years or however long God gives us what are you going to take with you into the presence of God Barak was in such an hour where he gathered 10,000 the hour was impossible. She said, you gather them. And when you do, the enemy's going to get gathered to you. Can you imagine? 
Now begin starting to do this. Begin to pray and seek for revival. Begin to evangelize. And you know what? All the worst enemies in Britain are all going to gang up and come marching. You won't need to go seek them. You won't need to find them. Just get up on that mountain and they're going to come knocking on your door. Would you do it? Would you fulfill that? And she says, God has commanded you. Well, the poor man said, I'll go but I want you to go with me. And you know the story of that. Said the honor's gonna go to a woman and all of that. But that isn't what I'm dealing with this morning. I wanna point something else out to you here. It talks about Issachar in this place. 10,000 of Zebulun and Naphtali, but Issachar is there as well. Look at Judges chapter five and 15 for a moment. And it says the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah at this moment of time. She hadn't commanded them. She had no prophecy for them, but they were with her. Do you know why Issachar could recognize the hour? They said, we know what hour this is. We can recognize a prophetess when we see it. We recognize the word of God. Do you think they were going out to fight a losing battle? I don't believe so. They actually said the odds are against us. This is impossible. But we do know they are. We wouldn't have done this a week ago. But you see, there's a Kairos moment. And something is going to happen. And the tables are going to turn. And God is going to do a miracle. And God is going to intervene. And you know what? Issachar is going to be a part of it. And so it said the princes of Issachar, that means the leadership we're going to act decisively. Give us in the church again a leadership that jointly act decisively. I'm tired of ditherers in the pulpit. I mean, men who don't know what hour it is. They don't know what they're doing. They refuse to deal with sin in the church. We need leadership that are decisive. They know they are, and they give leadership to the body of Christ. They walk in unity. I'm looking for leaders, you know. I'm looking for pastors, not for ministry, but for friendship and encouragement that we can stand together. I'm looking for the real body of Christ in London, in England, out across the world. I mean the real that are going to stand together. If you're a preacher, I'm going to encourage you. If you preach, I'm going to stand there and say, Amen, preach on, brother. I don't care about ministry. If you're some granny looking after your grandchildren, leading them to the Lord, I'm going, Amen, I'm 100% with you. We are the church of God. Now look what happens here. Issachar, the princes, were with Deborah. Even Issachar, not just the leaders, it's terrible when leaders go to battle and the people aren't there. It's terrible when you think, let the preacher go out to battle. We need real princes of Issachar who know they are and entire people to stand with them. We need entire churches that know the Kairos hour that we're living in at this time. Look what happens with them. Issachar also with Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben there were great thoughts of heart. Now look at, for a moment at this. The princes were with Deborah. They were with Barak. They were involved in this. And God commanded Barak, I want you to go on foot. They've got chariots. They are down in the valley. I want you to come off the mountain. Would you do that? I want you to leave the mountain, go down into the valley on your foot and attack the enemy. I think I'd have a few things to say to the Lord, wouldn't you? And yet here we have this time. There's a Kairos moment. If you don't act in this hour, you're going to miss it. If you don't do it now, well, we're going to have some more meetings and discuss this. I think we need to pray a bit longer. Do you realize if they call a 30-day prayer fast and meeting, prayer is vital, but not now. It is a time for action. You should have been praying all through. You should be prepared for this hour. So when it's this time, you go, I'm ready to act. I've done all my praying, studying, preparation. I know the hour. Let's go to this. And so we see Barak is going to run down on his feet. He didn't have a horse. He's going to run down the hill into the valley against 900 iron chariots and 100,000 soldiers trained for war. And we're going to run at them and charge at them. 
You better know what hour you're living in. You better discern the hour. Or you, if you judge with your eyes and ears, you won't do this. You won't even understand what is going on. And so it says they were on foot. In the previous chapter, in verse 10, it says, at his feet. In other words, Barak was a general on his feet, leading from the front. That's how I believe a leader leads in these days. They follow, uh, and, and Issachar follows courageous leadership. I can recognize Issachar because they follow godly leadership. That's what they do. That's what they want to do. We will leave the mountain and go into the valley because we know the hour that we're living in. The name Barak means lightning. He's going to move with lightning. People think he was a dither. Really? Would you run off a hillside and charge into the enemy at the front of it saying, Come guys! That man knew the hour he was living in. All of Issachar said, we're here because we know the hour that we're living in. But notice the end of verse 15. It's in the context of Issachar, very importantly, because we need to contrast Issachar with the tribe of Reuben. You see, many hear the call, few respond. It's always that way. You better be able to act decisively in the hour that God commands. What does it say about Reuben? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. For the divisions of Reuben. In Reuben at that time, listening this, hearing the prophecies, seeing what was happening, there were great divisions in Reuben. I believe the past year and a half, there are great divisions of Reuben in the churches of Britain. There is confusion in the churches of Britain. Stay home. You're not faxed. We, 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 don't, we, you, we need to be careful of you. Oh, so you don't spread the virus. Oh, we do. They said last year you wouldn't. There's a lot of confusion in this hour. And you know what? It's creating division. So the churches are discussing how they function in this hour. They can't even act decisively. Now, I'm not getting in, into a debate of what you should do or what I should do. That's, that, be it on your own head or listen to some of my videos you'll, you'll soon hear. But, you know, whatever you do, I, I, believe me, I'm not talking about that. But we need to act in the will of God. If we get caught off guard looking at all of these things, you're going to miss the hour that you actually live in. It says because of the divisions, the splits, the divides, the factions, the family disputes and rubens, because of that climate in the church amongst God's people, do you know what happened? There were great thoughts of heart. The term great thoughts of heart means decisions, resolutions, decrees. So look at the divisions amongst God's people. While Issachar is running down and foot behind Barak into the enemy's camp to destroy the enemy, and God's going to do a miracle, an amazing miracle. For 20 years we've lived like this, but it's going to be free tomorrow, I'll tell you. What's Reuben doing? They're at the top of the hill. They're all divided and split. And all of them in both camps, you know what they're doing? They're making decisions. I decree, I hate that word used in most of the church. I decree this, I decree that. <sighs> Don't get me started. And so here you have Reuben making decision. I'm making this decision. Well, I'm making this decision. Well, while all of you are up on the hill making your resolutions and your decisions and disputing and all caught up in this division. You're occupied with that. What about the enemy down in the valley? You are missing God's plan. There were great searchings of heart. In other words, they were examining their hearts. The next verse says, what? and this is God speaking to Reuben, why abodest thou among the sheepfolds? Good to be in the sheepfolds, but not in the day of battle, when you're meant to be out there fighting the enemy. To hear the bleating of the flocks. Oh, I enjoy hearing those sheep. Meh, meh, meh. And in that environment of the bleating of sheep, you're divided, you're disputing, you're decreeing. I think, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. Why do, why do we take a vote in the church about this? 
you're going to sit there. You're, you're dead. You're, you're going to miss your Kairos hour. You're going to have lots of tiny meetings and your church is utterly divided. It's in confusion. Where's your leadership? Good leadership would never allow that in the church. It'll not tolerate that. There's got to be a united people. And saints, it takes a lot of wisdom and a lot of grace. It really does. The next verse says, For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. There were examinations. While Issachar acted decisively with Barak, Reuben stood dithering, stayed at home, and let the battle go on. No wonder Genesis 49 and 4 says about Reuben, Jacob's prophecy, unstable as water. You're making all these decrees, decisions. You're caught up in church disputes and divisions and you don't even know the will of God. Do you know what unstable of water means? Sometimes it gets frozen. Whatever the atmosphere is, you're either freezing or you boil up. It's got nothing to do with you. You're unstable. But if you get in a good, uh, lively meeting, oh, praise the Lord. And then you get home and everyone's negative. Oh, it's all over. Oh God, where are you? You're unstable as water. That's what Reuben was, and utterly distracted. Thank God there was a victory. Do you know what Issachar done? They went down and won the victory, and they had peace for 40 years. Sometimes you have to fight to get peace. You want peace? Sometimes you have to fight a hard battle, an impossible battle. And we know that God intervened. A second one, I'll be brief on this. I almost missed this one when I was studying. And I went, how did I almost miss this? The second movement in which Issachar was moved and used in such an hour is found in Judges chapter 10. It's a judge called Tola who was raised up of God. Most people don't notice him because he's only mentioned in two verses. And yet he fits into this pattern. In Judges chapter 10 and verse 1, And after Abimelech, notice that, After Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir, in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years. And he died and was buried in Shamir. There's not much written about Tola, but he was a man of Issachar. Does he fulfill the pattern? I believe he does. Very little is written about him, but he was a son of Issachar, living at a certain unique time in history amongst God's people. And you know what? He arose in that hour. There was a set unique time that he arose in Israel. When did he arise in Israel? Notice verse 1. And after Abimelech, there arose to defeat, uh, to defend Israel, Tola, after Abimelech. Notice this very carefully. Most people don't even understand what God is doing here. When you go to the previous chapter, chapter 9, you have a very long chapter about Abimelech, a very strange chapter, a very confusing chapter. You cannot understand chapter 9 unless you look at Judges chapter 10 and verse 1. And we see God raising up a member of Issachar, a son of Issachar, a child of Issachar at an important hour. But you need to look at Abimelech in the previous chapter to understand it. Who was Abimelech? That's the question. What hour was this that they were living in? Abimelech was the son of Gideon. Gideon had... 70 children of his wives. Then he had another son by a concubine called Abimelech. And so you had Gideon with all of these children, real heirs to the family name. But there's this apostate who's come out of a concubine, out of another people, out of another family line. We've got a lot of Abimelechs that have come into the church in this hour. They've invaded the churches. They've taken over the pulpits in the city of London. The old preachers that used to be there are long gone. And now the Abimelechs are there. What's your genealogy preacher? 
Who's your mommy? Who's your daddy? Are you a thoroughbred? I want to know, do you know how you know if they're a thoroughbred, what they do with that position and with that power? Do you change the message? Do you move away from the cross? Do you deal with holiness in the church? Are you Abimelech or are you one of the 70? Well, we read in that chapter that Abimelech rises up and he is a wicked man. He has paid 70 bits of silver to carry out a task. He goes to his own people, his mother's concubine people. He goes to these people and he says, I ought to be king. I ought to rule over you. There's Gideon's 70 children. Do you want 70 men to rule over you? Or do you want me to rule over you? And so they paid him 70 bits of silver from the house of Baal. Notice where the money comes from. And then he begins to pay very base and vile men to carry out the task. Watch the people who a leader brings in around him. Watch the preachers he brings into his pulpit. Watch the people he begins to promote. And you ought to get very, very worried. We've destroyed our churches because we didn't take note of Abimelech. And so Abimelech rose up and he used these vile men to try and assassinate all the 70 children, the thoroughbred born of the seed of Gideon. He said, I want to annihilate them all and I want to become the king of the people of Israel. I'm talking about Issachar's hour. I'm talking about an hour that they were brought to. Well, he killed all 69 apart from one. Only one escaped. Abimelech had reigned for two years. And God sent an evil spirit into the midst to turn the people against Abimelech. Do you see God working here? He is preparing for an hour. Suddenly there is confusion where there was unity in Israel before. You know why? God's going to raise up a man of God out of nowhere, out of obscurity. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. Well, what is the standard? It's the word of God in my mouth and in my heart. Most people don't know that. When the spirit of God begins to move, you're going to see preachers and churches rise up and begin to preach the word of God again. I know the spirit of God is here this morning. I know he is here and I know he is working. And so we see Abimelech, all this confusion, all this disaster, and he is assassinated. And so the Bible says, then arose Tola to defend Israel. Do you know the word Tola? The name Tola means a worm. It's where we get that, that dye out of the scarlet, the red worm for the garments and the tabernacle and all. This Tola arose and we are told there that he reigned over Israel. He defended them for that time. And so we have the days of Deborah. Then we have the days of Tola. Third of all, we have the days of King David. You'll remember with King David, Saul was on the throne. Two years he was a humble man of God. Forty years he reigns. He's got the anointing. He's got the position. He's got the army. He's got the palace. He's got the city. And he used preachers weary. You're faithfully laboring away, feeding the sheep. And the men who have come in and taken over entire denominations, they've got no real Holy Ghost anointing. They're suspicious, insincere, changing the gospel, making the church into a disco, and you're breaking your back, feeding the sheep. I'm setting the stage of an era when David arose. For 13 years, David ran from Saul in caves, in the wilderness, in the land of the Philistines. And here is this ungodly leadership. It's anointed, but it's not anointed. It was chosen by God, and yet it's rejected by God. It, it actually was caught up in a divine moment of God, and yet it's utterly cast off the will and the purpose of God. For 40 years, Saul reigns as king, but there's no ark. He makes no attempt to bring the ark back. He's not a man of prayer. He's not a man of holiness. He's not a man consecrated unto God. And for 13 years, David is having to survive in all of these places from the hand of the enemy. Finally, in, one, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, when Saul was killed and he dies a terrible death, we read that they didn't go looking for David. 
the anointed of God, the chosen of God, the one who should be there. They appointed Ishabosh, who is Saul's fourth son, to become the second king of Israel. Again, there's another break on everything. I know what God's will is for the church, but there's an awful lot of hindrances in this hour. Saul is causing a lot of problems in the church of Britain. There is a, there's an absolute takeover of the church in my lifetime. I am utterly disgusted with it. But there's going to be an appointed time where things are going to change. I promise you, church of God, we are now living under the time of Ishaboth. David had had to hide in caves for those 13 years. But now he comes to Hebron. He is making a major move to Hebron where he's going to rule for seven years. Two of the tribes come to him to make him king of Judah. They actually recognize they are. God is raising up a young man to be ruler amidst God's people. The tribes were in conflict and tradition. Everyone had an opinion about Saul's house and the house of David. But it says in chapter 3 and verse 1, there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And so we see here, it is an utterly unique time. God is changing things amongst his people. But do you know what? David is despised. He is rejected. Most in the church do not realize in this hour what God is doing. But I'm telling you, God is at work. One of the most unique events in church history is happening right now. Most of the church don't realize it. But as I told you, I could do a little dance. I am excited. I have waited from a child for this hour. Five years old, I'm dreaming of this hour. I could tell you things God spoke to me that I believe are yet going to happen in the body of Christ. I have waited. I've prepared. I have longed. And you know what? As I watch the apostasy come into our churches, give me the Lord Jesus Christ again. Give me preaching on the blood of the Lamb again. Let's restore things again. You see, I see a change. But if you're going to make this change, you better be of Issachar in this hour. It's right in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, when David comes to Hebron for the first time. There's still a minority. There's still few. But there's something happening in this hour amongst God's people. It says in verse 32, And the children of Issachar came to David, which were men of understanding. It says that there are numbers of bands that begin to gather to David. They're small bands. You say you're in a small church. I don't care. I don't care if you're 10 people. If you discern the hour and you're praying and fasting, God is there in the midst. Give me a people of 10. Give me a church of 10 and I'll preach them. Saints of God, I would not take the biggest pulpits in this nation at this time. Find some small, obscure church and begin to preach the word of God. That is where God is moving in this hour. And so we see David comes to Hebron and there's these number of small bands, small churches, small gatherings of believers and they gather to David and it says they're ready, armed to the war. They know something is happening and so they begin to gather around David. And they came to David to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul over to him according to the word of the Lord. You see, there were those in that hour who said, we know God's will. We know the word of God. It's time for things to begin changing. Most of the church hasn't realized that yet, but they are going to begin to realize. And Issachar come. They had known the time previously was not right for David. They didn't join him at Adullam or at Siglag. But as soon as he got to Hebron, they said, this is the time. They didn't wait for him to be over all of Israel. They said, now is the time to build an army. Now is the time for the church to hear the trumpet like you did at break time there. What a blast of the trumpet. Can you imagine 10 people playing different trumpets, different tunes, different notes? Let's give a trumpet blast that's clear in this hour. It's time to gather. It's time to stir. At the right time, Issachar chose to follow the house of David. The house of David was still small, a minority, rejected, ridiculed, not in Jerusalem, but dynamic. 
David was a king without a nation, without a throne, without a crown. But God is beginning to move in this hour. And Ezekiel realized that God was finished with the house of Saul. Do you know when God's finished with churches and denominations? Have you ever been in a church like with Samuel the prophet who once ministered unto Saul and God says, leave and wipe the dust off your feet. It's time to depart since most of it is gone into apostasy and you need to flee. Find real churches. Find real preachers. I don't care if they're not very gifted. They may not be very eloquent, but are they pure? Do they preach the truth of God? Are they men of prayer? Don't judge them by gifting. Judge them by their faithfulness. And if you find a man like that, you stay there. I'm talking about what happened in God's plan here. That they, they begin to realize that God was finished with the house of Saul. It was the time. There is a period of time in which you've got to act. If you wait, you'll be too late. Now is the time to come to David to make him king. These small bands were ready for war. This is not sedition. This is not rebellion. This is not disorder. This is actually biblical order sin. We want a real church again. We're told here that there were 200 leaders of the men of Issachar. It was a remnant within a remnant of leaders, only 200. But you know what? You don't get as many opinions, I want to tell you. Sometimes the smaller the better. I could accomplish more with a small band of men and women than I ever could with a large church that is riddled with compromise. Give me the real, a small band who know what hour it is. And so the heads of Issachar arose. There was real leadership. There was real direction. I can identify an Issachar leader that said this is the of God's movement and moves with it. They understood the hour that they lived in, but to know what Israel ought to do. Issachar came to David amidst a remarkable move of God, and they say, we know, David, you other tribes, we know what God is saying in this hour. We know the hour, and we need to get ready. All of this is coming back again. Fourth of all, let me move on. King Nadab. This is the fourth and final one I'm going to deal with here. And I've got a warning for you. Our message is the sons of Issachar. Are you the son of Issachar? Where are the sons of Issachar in Britain today? Where's the pastors? Where's the churches? Where's the denominations? Where's the movements who are speaking, thus saith the Lord, preaching the word of God in this hour? I want to find them. Fourth and finally, the days of King Nadab. Nadab was the king of the northern kingdom. Two tribes in the south, ten tribes in the north. There was two different genealogies after Solomon. The tribes split. The two in the south were based out of Jerusalem. They represent the true remnant of God's people in every generation. The ten in the north represent the denominational churches that go into apostasy. They have a form of Christianity, but they've lost the real. Those two southern tribes were always the real remnant of God. And that's how you need to read the Bible to understand it at this time. Well, who was King Nadab? He was the son of Jeroboam, the first king of the northern tribes, of the ten tribes. Jeroboam snatched ten of the tribes away and left two. And after all, God did choose him, didn't he? God did actually appoint this. It was fulfilling God's will to split the kingdom. But he was an evil man. Do you know there's men in the pulpit who are driven with a purpose known? I've got a part to play, but they're evil men and they're leading the church into compromise. They're going to establish idolatry in the church. They're going to create unity. They're going to have numbers, but they'll raise up two golden calves. They're going to outrun Aaron and raise up golden calves in the church. False revivals entertainment in the church, worship movements like Bethel and hill songs and all the rest. And if offended you, just come speak to me afterwards and I'll tell you how much I love you. All of these things are happening. You see, you see Jeroboam had split the kingdom and was creating something united. Well, his son was called King Nadab. 
who was going to arise. We have this in 1 Kings chapter 15. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel. But he did evil in the sight of God. He made Israel to sin. And he provoked the Lord to anger against him. Now we're looking at another Kairos moment. Another movement with politics, social events, and the people of God. If Issachar doesn't know what to do now, it's going to be tragic. Here is a second king of the northern kingdom. Utter apostasy, wickedness. But we're told there's a man called Basha of the house of Issachar, who was a captain in Nadab's army. He was actually there in the army. He was trained. He was fighting for Nadab. But he could discern the art. He's a son of Issachar. He knows that a change is coming. In fact, previously, he knew the prophecy given in 1 Kings chapter 14, in the previous chapter, by Ahijah, the prophet. Listen to what he says about Nadab. According unto the saying of the Lord, which he spake by his prophet, Nadab's going to get removed. All the house of Jeroboam is going to get annihilated. God is going to judge this wickedness and this idolatry that's come in amongst God's people. God is going to do it. Basha, the son of Issachar, is listening to him. I know what our it is. God's going to change everything. It's a Kairos movement. Everything's going to change in the kingdom. But he's not a servant. And he's not a soldier in the right sense of it. And he's not a scholar of scripture and of holiness. Do you know what? He was an opportunist. And there's a lot of Issachars that are opportunists. I know Bible prophecy. I know all about the Antichrist. I can teach the things of the Word of God. But their hearts and motives are wrong. They can discern the hour of what's going on at this time. They realize Bible prophecy is happening. But there's something fundamental wrong with their heart. Their attitude and their motive. They know the right hour. They know what needs to be done. They know what God has prophesied. But they're using it actually for themselves. You see, Issachar and its calling is, is depraved if it gets used like this. Do you remember when King David, as a young man, before he was crowned, went into a cave with King Saul? And there Saul comes in, and David's there with one of his soldiers, and his soldier says, wasn't it prophesied that he would deliver your enemy into your hands and cut off Saul? Wasn't there a prophecy? And David's there thinking... That's true. Remember he cut off the edge of his garment. And then his heart smote him. And he turned to his soldier. And he says, God help me. I will not kill God's anointed. You see, you could say, this is providence for me to take over this church. It's providence to split this church. It's providence for me me to grab ministry. You need to be very careful. I've watched decades of this. Haven't you seen it? Decades in the church. There are Issachars, children of Issachar, who are professional in Bible prophecy. They know when to move in a church. They know when to act. They know when things are going to change. They know when the people are ready. But it's all for themselves. You know what? You are despicable if you do that. You better walk away like David said. I'm not going to cut off God's anointed. It is going to happen. This is going to change. But I've got faith in God to do it. Things of God never change things yourself. Have faith in God. Named that after two years of reigning. Listen to what it says. That Issachar, or sorry, Basha, the son of Issachar, conspired against them. He brought about a coup. He usurped. He assassinated the rightful king. It was in fulfillment of prophecy at the right time. But he took things into his own hand. Basha smote the king to fulfill the will of God. But with the wrong motive. You can do the right thing. You can feel the call of God and get into ministry. How did you get into ministry? Who put you there in ministry? You go by and know it's God's will. That's not what I'm asking. You may have a calling on your life. But are you trying to create it? I've had hundreds of young preachers come. They come and say, I'm ready to preach. New suit, a big Bible. And they say, Brother Keith, I'm ready to preach. 
In fact, I'm ready to preach in your pulpit. I go, you've only come to two meetings. So I said, well, tell me about it. I had one brother come, said, sit down there. He said, I had a dream that I was sit, uh, standing in your pulpit preaching. I said, well, brother, let me tell you about the biblical call of God on ministry and how it'll break your heart and that there's 22 qualifications for ministry, for eldership in the local church. Only one of them is apt to teach. The other 21 is all about character. I never saw him back in the church ever again. I was very nice to him. I was trying to help him in ministry and get him there. But you know what? He wanted in the pulpit without of all, all of this other stuff. Do you realize Asha was the same? Here he is. He can discern the art. He understands certain things about the church. But if you cannot recognize a Basha, you'll sit in a church and King Basha is there ruling. And I tell you, it's manipulation. He'll destroy you if you rise up against him. He'll cut you apart. He'll lie upon you. He'll suppress anything that, that challenges him. And yet he stole the throne of the northern kingdom. Why did he conspire? He knew the hour. He killed all the family of that line of Jeroboam. He not only killed that son, he killed the entire, every single child. He was an entire mission. Nobody is going to challenge my authority. Nobody is going to take the throne from me. I'm going to annihilate all opposition. You don't discern the hour then. You really do not understand what all this is about. You think it's about ministry and positions and being noted for your ministry, you don't realize what you're doing. He killed all the family. He utterly annihilated that line. He was an insecure man. And if you're an insecure person, I'll get nervous around you. You see, insecure people are not secure in God. They, they can be, I tell you, you don't want to trust your, turn your back upon them or place your trust in them. Someone who walks close with God is very secure. If you can take everything off me, please do. Please do. It's almost broken my heart. If you can steal my church, please do. You, you can take it away. Go ahead. Go ahead if you can do it. Steal my ministry. Steal my place in YouTube. Please do. Please do. I don't care if every door in the world shuts. Me and Jesus, I love him. I'm walking with him. If he opens up every door, praise God. If he shuts every door, praise God. I'm the very same preacher. I'll preach to three people like I will to 3,000. We need real men of Issachar in this hour again. He also went to war with King Asa of the south. There were two tribes in the south. King Asa was a man of God like unto David. And we see that this Basha then moved into the southern two kingdoms and he built his base at Ramah, a stronghold, and began to attack Jerusalem and tried to attack this King Asa. For 24 years he's on the throne. And for 24 years he fights against a real man of God. You see, he knows the time, he knows the hour, he knows the change, he knew when to move. And there's a lot in the church of our day. They knew when to move in upon all of this. It, it's like all that pain, uh, Paul Cain stuff with Met Westminster Chapel in this city. How did a man like Paul Cain, an immoral, drunken, homosexual, manage to get into that church and begin to prophesy to the pastor of it and say, I'm a prophet, a man of God. Do you see what has happened? These are very, very real things. Church is destroyed. And what a consequence in this nation. I believe in the gifted ministry of prophet. I know a prophet is real. I know there's real prophets in the church. I have no doubt about that. But not that type of ministry. Do you know what happened many years ago? Was when the Toronto, um, not the Toronto revival, but the Florida revival began. And I hate to use that word revival. And we were running a Bible school. And as that Bible school run, people kept coming to me and said, what do you think about this? In fact, Julie was one of them, emailed said, what do you think? All the leaders are running after this. Boom, bam, the biggest view of any revival on television. Well, I'm there in a Bible school with 30 students teaching them every day, several messages a day. No time to look at it. I went to my screen, looked at it for two minutes. I come back, told them, I said, mark my words, within two months, you're going to find immorality with Todd Bentley. Within two months, you're going to find immorality in that pulpit. 
I was wrong. Two weeks later, he gets exposed. He's been drinking in the local pubs, sleeping with his his secretary canoodling. Do you know what that man made me a prophet? Do you think I was prophesying because I knew? I know the character of the saints of God. When you know the character of God and the word of God, I can stand here and say, I promise you within two months, immorality is in that pulpit. I know. You know why? He put Paul King up there and he put Paul Jones up there and they're saying this is revival, the greatest revival and it's only the beginning. But I'm over there in Ireland, the back of beyond, saying within two months, Saints of God, I'm telling you, we need an awakening in this hour. In the hour of King Nadab, what a very sad thing, that Issachar wasn't in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. God cut off his heart, uh, entire ministry and judged that let me finish here, saints of God. I've given you an awful lot of stuff I know. I can keep you here. <laughs> to midnight. <laughs> I don't like watches anyway. I love Kairos moments, but I hate TikTok moments. And we say in our church, one of these days, and I'll be very wise, one of these days, we're going to start preaching. Since we are really at the end. I've been a student of revivals from a child. I've studied them. This is an era of apostasy. The darkness is going to get worse. The political situation is going to get worse. The moral condition is going to fall. You haven't seen anything yet. Brace yourself. Hear me. You have not even begun to see the beginning of this. You've got to understand this. When we went into the Gulf War, just on the border of Iraq, our sergeant sat us all down. They're all there, and they've done this with every British soldier. And they said, this is how they said it, my sergeant, 50% of you are about to die. Write your last letters to your wife, your girlfriend, your mommy, because 50% of you won't come back. One of my mates in our squadron, I, he went into the officer and was crying tears, begging. He says, I know I'm going to die. You can't let me go. And he said, why did you join the army? It was for this hour, this time. You think you just enjoyed all that training and pay just for yourself? This is why you were a soldier. Do you know what he done? He went back to his tent, shot himself in the foot. He was so scared of dying. We were told, do you know what that army does? You've got to do that. Because you know what? We're dealing with war. This isn't children's game. I was 18 years old. They're not playing games. Some of you are going to die, but you better face it as soon as we cross that Iraqi border. I'm so glad they were wrong. So glad it wasn't like that. But do you know what they're doing? Preparing. Preparing. Arm yourself with this mind to suffer. Saints of God, it's time for us to suffer. No one said amen. (laughs) I'm watching. The Bible and and Peter, we are taught a whole doctrine of suffering. And we as the church have been so comfortable, we don't, someone don't, um, defriends us on Facebook and we go on being persecuted. (laughs) I have depression, pastor, can can you counsel me? How am I going to get through this? Read church history. Mm-hmm. And you'll see what we're called to. What must we do? Is the car knew what to do at that right time in history, in the Word of God, in politics, in social society, to know what Israel ought to do? Israel were at their command. They had a message for the entire people. They were a small people, a wise people. A prepared people with a vital message for that hour that may have been ignored in the previous decades but this wasn't a normal hour it wasn't preparation anytime it's train hard fight easy in the army when we went to the Gulf War it was easy because the training was so intensive so overwhelming such a pressure that when we went into it it was a lot easier to face the enemy than our trainers 
back at camp. Do you know what you've just been in? If you've been prepared for this hour, you've been getting trained for this hour. It's all going to be over, finished, and we're home. I'm going home, saints of God, I don't know about you. And I'll be glad to see the back of this whole world of ours. I'm going to see the King. I'm going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. But the end is not yet. We are in the birth pangs, and it's intensifying. It's intensifying. This is our last hour to be Issachar. There's going to be an Issachar people train who stand up in this hour and speak clearly and say, this is what we are to do. This is how we're to act. And then it's all over. In the army, I always left. In that three-mile run that we had to do every year, it was always that last 100 metres. I always ran the fastest. Every year, the guys, they have done it every single year. They got the front of the line. We ran a mile and a half out, all together, running together. We stopped, and they said, now run back a mile and a half at your own pace. And we all lined up in that line. I got right to the back. And all these guys got up the front and said, we're rushing off. Most of them I passed by halfway. I just started off nice and lightly. I said, I'm in it for the whole run. I'm going to be there at the end. And you know what? I built and built and built. And as I got closer to the end, my speed built. I gave more. And that last 100 metres, I ran with all my power to the finish to make sure my time was clocked up. Most of those guys had exhausted themselves after half a mile. But saints of God, I want you to be there at the end. You now are in a charismatic. Can we pray together before I close? Let's just stand here. You can